So, um, so my name is Elizabeth Pena. I am a physical medicine and rehab doctor. So a lot of times I'll introduce myself as just a rehab physician, a rehab doctor, um, but it's physical medicine and rehab, physiatry, physiatrist, if you haven't heard the term. I call it the best kept secret in medicine because honestly I didn't even know about the field until I was shadowing a physician before going into medical school. And still a lot of times you can't go to some cities and fi find a physiatrist or a PM&R doctor. So I like to think what we do is very important. Um, it's kind of in the name, physical medicine and rehab. A lot of uh, our focus is on function, keeping people active and keeping their daily function kind of at their, at their norm. A lot of times after an injury, after a stroke, after a traumatic brain injury, after somebody suffers an injury, maybe back pain, a lot of times our what we call basic baseline level of functioning can go down. And so our goal is to really get that patient back to where they were at before an injury or before an illness. So it's such a broad field. So I can't, I'm not gonna get into all the details, but I, I do see a lot of patients with neuropathy. Some of the work we do at our inpatient hospitals, a lot of times I tell people, after you're in the hospital for whatever reason, maybe you had a pneumonia, maybe you had a stroke, maybe you were in a car accident and had a really bad injury. If you're not ready to go home safely, and I use that term a lot, safely, when I'm like thinking about why I'm admitting somebody to a hospital, because I don't feel they're safe to go home at that point, at that time, without more rehab. So they come into the rehab hospital and then physical therapy works with them, occupational therapy, respiratory therapy, and I do, a lot of times when we use the word physical medicine rehab, people will think that I'm a therapist, you know, whether it be physical or occupational. We don't, we don't do specific therapy. I do have an idea of what a therapist does because I've observed them. We order therapy a lot, but we, as a physician, we don't actually do that, play that role, but we do interact a lot with different therapists. I read a lot of notes that therapists write back to me. It might be from a physical therapist, an occupational therapist a speech therapist where they come back and tell me what they're doing with the patient and if that patient might need more rehab, more therapy, or whether or not they think they're good to maybe just do a home exercise program. Um, and then, so that's kind of the in, inpatient, that's kind of how you get there. Outpatient, we get referred for all different kinds of reasons. We're one of the doctors that can actually do EMG's nerve conduction studies electromyography. So some of you, if you've had neuropathy, you may have already had one of those tests where they zap your nerves a little bit and see how fast they're traveling. Or maybe you've done it twice or three times. So we actually, as a physiatrist, are trained to do that test. Um, and then we just, so I see a lot of neuropathy kind of on a regular basis. So whenever you see PM&R, yeah, you know what we do. Do you have any questions about what I do, what we might do? Okay. So one of the physicians I was actually shadowing, not shadowing with, working with, actually asked me to come talk to you guys. He, and I was like, yeah, sure. He was telling me kind of what he, some of the presentations he's done in the past, and he was asking like what my approach would be. I'm thinking more functional. Um, I know I was looking at some of the presentations that are online that you guys have heard in the past. A lot of what I'm gonna mention kind of is a more broad overview of some of the talks you've had where they've gone into more detail. A lot of the stuff I'm gonna mention, you can have a whole hour talk on, but I want you to kind of see the big picture and the importance of really being active and being safe as you're, if you remain active. Because we all know the population is getting older, right? What's the most important thing about as we age? It's our quality of life, right? It's, good. it's not good to say I wanna to to, live to be 95 years old what kind of 95 year old do you want to be is the question and how are you going to stay that how are you going to stay active and stay healthy all right so i titled it staying safe and active just because that's what came to my mind at the time all right so symptoms of neuropathy this is just an overview of symptoms you may have some you might not nerve pain and we'll talk a little bit more about that nerve pain Muscle cramps. Some people don't realize that when you have cramps or spasms in your legs, that can actually be as a result of the neuropathy itself. Weakness. So remember that neuropathy affects different kinds of nerves. The sensory nerves that cause the nerve pain, but also our motor nerves can be affected. 
Uh, depending on the type of neuropathy, I'm not, again, there's different types of neuropathy. Everybody might have a specific different diagnosis. But in general, neuropathy affects nerves, sensory nerves, motor nerves, and then we're talking about some autonomic nerves in a little while. So if we have weakness from those motor nerves getting affected, then you can start to have decreased range of motion. Because as we get weaker, we might not move our joints as much as we normally would because that muscle's weaker. Uh, high arched feet, claw toes, some different kinds of neuropathy. As the muscles get imbalanced, then you start to see some deformity come in, maybe, as some muscles stay stronger and some muscles are weaker, then those kind of imbalance each other out. And then as our range of motion decreases, we can actually get contractures. You might actually see individuals who, you know, can't move their ankle as great as they used to, or you might not be able to move that elbow as good. Uh, and then you have to remember that a lot of times with neuropathy, it affects our proprioception. That's really like our position sense, movement sense, how we move in space. And so what that does is it affects our balance, it affects our coordination, um, and then just our posture as well, postural instability. So neuropathy affects a lot of things. So when you think neuropathy, I don't want you thinking I have nerve pain, because that's, we put that first, because that might be the classic, typical presentation, but it affects a lot of other parts, okay? Uh, all right, so why don't we stay active? These are just three. I thought you guys could share more with me. We all have excuses. I do. Why, why don't I get up and do what I want to do or go out and be more active? I'm tired at the end of the day. We kind of sometimes make choices to do other things with our time. But some of the barriers might be just pain. Maybe, it's, maybe it really does limit the amount of activity that you have because you don't want to go do that 30-minute walk in the mall or that uh, outing with your family members because you, feel, you know that when you get back home, sometimes it's just anticipating the extra pain that might come along with it. And then safety. Sometimes people are actually scared to go and do certain workouts or routines because they're afraid they might, as we saw from the other slides, all those symptoms, what does that put you at, at risk for? What are we all? A, a fall risk, right? And you're scared. What happens if I, get a, if I do fall and have a hip fracture or something like that? So safety is a barrier. And then just lack of support. Sometimes it's good to have companionship when we go work out or just to go out on an outing. Um, any others that you guys can think of why you might not stay as active as you would like to? You're helping me because if I do this presentation again, I want to add to it. So if you guys have any, uh, you jump on in and you'd rather sit and read a book. So just kind of priorities, right? And sitting, sitting and reading a book is not, is good. We'll talk about that, but that's all good. Um, but those are the, I think the primary barriers, right? Pain, safety concerns, and then just not having somebody to go do what you want to do with, right? All right, all right. first thing, if, before you can go out in the community, you have to be safe in your own home environment, right? So we have to be safe at home. Unfortunately, as physicians or even as therapists, we can't go into everybody's home and do a home safety eval. Now, there are some therapists who will if there's a concern, but so you have to take that responsibility for yourself and say, how, you have, how can I make my home safer for me? We have a lot of patients come into a rehab hospital who've had a fall at home. It's not even at a friend's house. It's right in their own bedroom, right? And so you have to think about how can I be safer at home? So these are just a couple of things. Again, add to my list because I'm going to present this later maybe. So declutter, just keeping things off the floor so that you're not tripping on things that you might run into. Um, avoid throw rugs. They are beautiful, but they're a big hazard. Um, I see it all the time in the hospital setting, in a clinic setting, where we have these throw rugs at the primary entrance and it's flipped because somebody's almost tripped on it, right? So if you have any throw rugs at your house that are just other than keeping maybe your feet warm, which is nice, put some maybe some warm, cozy socks on instead, but get a, you know, get, really be careful with where you place those. Night lights, there's a lot of falls that just happen at night, keeping a little a night light in. If you have a clapper light, those work great because then you can clap it off when you get back into bed because um, you want to be able to see where you're going. Non-slip mats for the bathtub. I probably wouldn't have thought of this, because I have not been using one, but my dad came over to my house a couple weeks ago, and he's never been in my apartment here in Austin, 
it's been three years, but he, he came up. Otherwise, I would have known this earlier. He's like, where's your bath mat? I'm like, I thought he was talking about the rug, like on the floor, which I usually just throw a towel down. <laughs> and so I was like, bath mat, what are you talking about? He's like, you know, in the tub so I don't fall. I was like, OK, I don't have one of those. So he went out to the store, and now I have two bath mats in both of my tubs. <laughs> right? And I actually do feel, I do, I feel safer when I'm in the tub. I'm not slipping all over the place. So bath mats. And then adaptive equipment. Um, some of these you might not think about unless you've really been in like a rehab setting where, uh, where maybe you really need it. Most of you seem pretty functional, but grab bars, when we're thinking about preventing injury, preventing a fall. So grab bars, reachers. Um, if you have bad pain or bad knees, bad back, you know, the little reachers that aid you to guide things off, grab things off the floor. There's even reachers to help you, you know, if you need help clothing getting, you know, pulling up your pants and the like. Um, elevated toilet seats, uh, chair chairs, there's bedside commodes, we can get into it, but there's a list of medical equipment, durable <coughs> medical equipment. So any of those things around the house where you feel, you know what, I don't feel quite safe doing this activity, if it's bathing, whatever it might be, think about what can I do to make it safer, okay? And then lifestyle changes. This is the hardest part, because this is what takes motivation, right? And really what we call behavior modification. Yes, ma'am. Um, when I shower now, uh -huh. especially if my husband is alone, and he's hard of hearing anyway, um, I put the cell phone on the floor right outside of the shower. Great. Yeah, no, that's a perfect example, right? Because if you do fall and have a problem, you want to be able to call for help, right? I, keep, I, I do the same. Keep it close. You want to have it in reach. Any other things that you guys can think of in the home that for safety? In the bathroom, you can have a, a rug that is non-skid. Right, you exactly. Mm -hmm. Very good, yeah, the non-skid rugs are perfect. Uh, yeah, don't do my, what I said about the towel thing. That's not safe. It is, it is. So some people actually won't, you know, have that tub. They'll actually change it to be, you know, to a shower so that you're not having to climb up and over the tub. So yeah, I've seen that a lot, where people have actually renovated their bathrooms at that time if they need to. Um, OK, so lifestyle changes. We're going to talk a little bit more about exercise, but we all know that exercise is great for us. I'm not telling you anything new. Uh, there's so many studies out there that show the benefits of exercise that actually show that they're better than many medications that we use. But we still, a lot of times, we don't hear it enough, I think, from our doctors to say really, you know, exercise is important. Um, so diet and exercise, balanced diet, healthy diet. Um, if you smoke, it, you know, titrate down gradually, trial. They say the more times we try to quit, the more likely we will be to eventually. Most people fail the first time or two. But smoking does decrease blood flow to our nerves, to our muscles, to our heart, to everything. Um, massage, I was meant to put that, you're gonna we're gonna talk about massage later. It's not really a lifestyle change, but it could be a lifestyle change if you make a key effort to make an appointment to go get a massage, or make it a key habit to ask that family member to, to rub your neck or whatever it might be, rub your hands, rub your feet. Um, sleep, you get, she mentioned something in the book about, I don't know what, which book, it was just a second ago, and it, tr it triggered me. Sleep and mood are so interrelated. Pain is interrelated with sleep. If you don't get a good night's sleep, the day's just off to a bad start, right? I mean, it just, it's so key to our health. Um, I don't know if you guys promote this, most of you may be. The, if you have bad neuropathy in your feet and it hurts for things to touch, you know, tactile touch, a lot of times with neuropathy will get increased sensation, things that used to feel good, that warm, cozy blanket you used to love now doesn't feel that great anymore. There are, they actually sell um, devices that can lift the sheet off your feet, if any of you guys use those. I was Googling it um, to look at some pictures and the like, because I've heard of them. We'll keep them in the rehab hospital if somebody has really bad neuropathy, so that we elevate that, the sheet off the feet. Uh, examine your feet should be something that you do regularly. If you have, specifically if you have neuropathy in your feet, changes in your feet, 
if you're not examining them, make sure that a family member or a friend is pretty regularly because we really don't notice. It's kind of like when you, I'm trying to equate this, um, maybe your hair, young ladies who want to grow their hair out. You're trying really hard to grow your hair. And every day you look in the mirror and you're like, you know what, my hair's not really growing. But then you see a friend two months later, she's like, wow, your hair's really long. It's really growing, right? So the same thing with, we just don't notice those small changes that happen kind of on a daily basis. You might not realize how bad maybe your lack of sensation has gotten. So it's a good thing to kind of just keep up with that. Uh, it's good to have your doctor examine your feet. First thing you should do when you go into your doctor's office, if you have neuropathy in your feet, you should take your shoes off and just be prepared, you know? Let them see your feet. All right, comfortable shoes kind of equates with it, um, goes together. Um, you know, there's so different type of shoes for neuropathy, the wide toe box, you'll hear different types. You know, the main thing is that they're comfortable, that they're not causing any extra, you know, they're so tight that you're waking up or coming out from your activity with your feet swollen because they're too tight. So just pay attention to your comfort. Uh, Avoid pressure on the nerves. If you have neuropathy, you're, depending on the type of neuropathy, you might be just more vulnerable to having other nerves injured, like compressive neuropathies, like carpal tunnel, maybe an ulnar, neuro, ulnar neuropathy here at the elbow. So just be aware of that. Avoid crossing the legs for long periods of time. Um, even just driving. A lot of times people will rest their elbow kind of on the little, what's the little handbar here, you know? So anything that keeps your nerves compressed for a long period of time, just be aware of that. And then mobility devices. You guys have all, I see a couple of different canes in the room, that's great. Uh, canes, a walker, wheelchairs, scooters. A lot of times the most important concern I hear from patients is I don't want to lose my independence. I don't want people to look at me and think I'm old now because I have a cane in my hand, right? So just those different feelings about it. But you really, it's so important just to be safe, especially if you're walking on unlevel surfaces and you feel a loss of balance or feel unsteady. Um, scooters are great for like community distances, like in Target, Walmart, if you're gonna be there for a little while. Uh, and that's not taking your, that's really not taking your independence away. It's taking, it's making your life a little bit easier, making you maybe more active than you would be otherwise. Because you may have used the scooter in the chair while you were shopping around Target for 30 minutes, but you actually had to make an effort to get your clothes on, get dressed, drive in your car, in and out of the car and get there and then get back home, right? So if you sit in a scooter for 30 minutes at the store, no big deal, right? Um, canes. Uh, Talk to your doctor about the, you know, the hand that you use the cane in. Typically, we advise patients, you know, the opposite hand is the one that you place the cane in. So just be aware that you're using your cane correctly. It changes a little bit depending on if you have any hip pain or knee pain or why you're using your cane. Uh, but on just a general basis, we typically say the opposite side of where the painful limb is or the weak limb is. All right. All right. Benefits of exercise. I had this title, Benefits of Activity, because I think exercise and activity kind of go together. I changed it back to exercise. Because I think we should make a, really an effort to do some kind of activity to keep healthy. You don't have to call it exercise if you don't want to. But why do we typically, what, what are the benefits? We talked about, there's plenty of studies. What are the benefits? Heart, right? So that's kind of with the endurance. That's the endurance aspect. Being able to actually, when you think, why, am I, why do I stop my walk? You go for a walk and you're like, you know what, I'm going to walk for 15 minutes today, but you're only able to do 10. Why is it that you stop? Is it because your heart? Because you feel like, oh my God, I can't breathe anymore. My heart's beating too fast. Or is it because of pain somewhere that's limiting? So it, you're right. Exercise helps endurance. It helps your heart. It helps strength, balance. Our strength just decreases as we age. It's just a fact. It's going to decrease after a certain age, a certain percent every five, ten years. We're going to get weaker. So you have to. We have to do what we can to maintain. I took a physiology of aging class one time as a 
when I was working on my master's. And I was like, oh my God, I was probably, I don't know, 30 something at the time. And I was like, I'm aging. It started already. <laughs> it's true, but it's true. Like after like 20, like when we think about bone health and it, it happens a lot younger than we think, like our body's physiological way of, of aging. So we're all aging. So we have to do what we can to keep ourselves healthier as we age, right? Maintaining health, maintaining balance. Uh, it helps with our core, our core stability and our core strength, getting out and doing some activity. And remember, it's this core that keeps us upright, that keeps us balanced and more stable if we lose our balance to prevent a fall. Range of motion, the stretching aspect. Um, and then it just actually reduces our pain. And that's just true. Most people think, you know what, I can't get up and do that treadmill because, or the bike because my knee's going to hurt. And that's true. It might hurt for the first time or two. But actually over time, as you do it, that pain actually decreases. And I tell patients all the time, because we do see patients who have pain, um, that the long-term pain control isn't a pain medication. It's rehabilitation, like a physical therapy or the like, even if it's intermittent. You might not stay in physical therapy consecutively for a whole like year time, but you might need, you know, a little bit of therapy thrown here and there for, best, for the best long-term pain control. All right, autonomic symptoms. I wanted to talk about autonomic systems before we talked about exercise. Uh, so we talked about neuropathy affecting, sorry, the way it, so you might have to flip it on the backside. Um, we talked about neuropathy affecting our sensory nerves, our motor nerves. But they also can affect our autonomic nerves. You might have autonomic symptoms. Those are the nerves that innervate like our heart and our blood vessels, okay? So some of those symptoms, you might have an abnormal heart rate uh, where your heart rate's higher than it normally would be at rest. Or maybe your heart rate doesn't respond normally to exercise or normally to stress, right? Or to those things where you expect your heart rate to go up. Um, Standing, sleep, what should happen when we go to sleep? Our heart rate should kind of relax a little bit, but go down a little bit, right? So sometimes our heart rate gets a little bit abnormal. And then we might also see problems with managing our blood pressure, okay? Because a lot of blood pressure issues have to do with our blood vessels and how they control the resistance there. So orthostatic hypotension might be a result of neuropathy. Have you guys heard that term, orthostatic hypotension? So when we go from like a sitting, a laying down position, a supine laying down position to a sitting position to standing. So we're changing our position. <clears throat> our blood pressure should not drop a certain degree. It might go down a little bit, but if it drops too much, what happens is we can start feeling a little bit dizzy, a little bit faint, like I'm gonna bounce out now, or I stood up too fast, that kind of response. So we can see some of those orthostatic symptoms uh, with neuropathy. Um, then I just gave some examples of the, what you might feel. You might feel weak. You might have vision changes where you feel like things, kind of there's a cloud coming over where things are kind of blackening out. Um, so those might be signs of orthostasis. So what can you, I, I just kind of threw this in, the thing that you can a lot of times do to prevent that, especially like early morning when you're getting out of bed or wherever you might be, is to actually sit at the edge of the bed for a little while without jumping up immediately and doing some like just pumping of your feet um, to get that blood flowing back up to, to here, to your brain, so you don't feel those symptoms. Um, but not, oh, and then I threw in elevated pressures, because sometimes with neuropathy, or different types of, and this is, not everybody's going to have these symptoms, but some people might, uh, might have problems with their blood pressure actually going up when it used to be pretty low, okay? All right, so things to consider kind of when you're working out with neuropathy. So remember that any time of workout exercise routine should be in three stages, some kind of a warm up, some kind of the actual exercise or activity itself, and then a cool down. And this can go with anything. It doesn't have to be like a formal exercise. But some kind of warm up, that's really to prevent an injury, right? To get your muscles kind of a little bit uh, going, get the blood flowing, get our heart pumping a little bit harder to tell it, I'm about to work out, be prepared. And then working out, whether or not it may just be going for a walk. I don't know if anybody jogs in here, going for a little jog or going for the treadmill or a bike. Um, 
And then cooling down, it, the reason it's so important to cool down is because now for the last, let's say, 10, 15 minutes, you've been pumping blood pretty, regular, pretty hard to your heart, back to your heart, right? Because the, our legs, think about our legs, is, remember we talked about the pumping at the side of the bed, that helps get that blood flow back to our heart. So when we've been pumping so hard with whatever workout we're doing, even if it's just a walk at the mall or whatever it might be, you've been working maybe a little bit harder than you would. If you don't cool down, that doesn't, your body doesn't have time to adjust because you've been pumping so hard and then you just stop all of, all of a sudden. If you stop too soon, then you might start feeling a little bit lightheaded as well, a little dizzy, a little faint, okay? So cool down is important. Don't stop your uh, exercise and then just sit. Maybe walk around a little bit longer. And then consider perceived exertion when exercising. What does that mean? We've always kind of been taught like our heart rate max, if, if you guys are familiar, like 220 minus your age, right? Well, if you have neuropathy, we talked about the diff how it might affect your heart rate. We might not be able to really rely on that heart rate to tell us our, we, our heart rate max might not be that true heart rate max. So listen to your body is what that means, kind of that rating and perceived exertion. They use that term a lot in rehab settings, like cardiac rehab settings, where um, they'll say, how hard are you working? Does it seem really light to you at the moment? Does it seem a little bit hard, somewhat hard, really, really hard? You don't want to be working really, really hard. If you're working really, really hard, you should not be working really, really hard. You need to back it down a little bit. So listen to your body. You should be working, you know, where you feel a little bit of, yeah, this is a little bit hard, right? Because you're, you're doing some activity where you're making your body work harder than it normally would. So listen to your body is my point, okay? Because you just can't rely on a number, 220 minus your age to determine your max, and then say I'm gonna work at 70% of my max heart rate if that's not your true max heart rate. Unless you've had like a stress test or something that's told you what your max heart rate is. That's a little bit different. I'm talking about just in general, listen to your body. Uh, stay hydrated, we talked about orthostasis. If we stay hydrated, we're less likely to get dizzy and have a fall. Um, and then the aquatic exercise and Tai Chi, I just I put those at the bottom because I think those are two really good activities if you don't do already that are, have just been shown to have so many benefits. Uh, tai Chi probably has, I mean, there's just so much research out there that shows it helps with our core, it helps with balance, strength. Um, I've se I haven't done it myself. I've seen some demonstrations and partaked in those demonstrations but not like, has anybody here actually participated like in a, perfect, perfect. Did you see the benefits? Could you feel them? Oh yeah. Yeah? For balance. For balance, very good, yeah. And, the, and then you said yes too, right? Did you, see, did you notice some benefits, anything? The balance. The balance, yeah. So, uh, something to consider, to look into. I think, you know, you can probably just, you guys do it locally, so I'm assuming there's, Oh, there you go. There's a class here Thursday mornings at 9.30. Very good. So Tai Chi is something to consider. The, I mean, the research is out there. It helps. And then swimming. These are, these are good just examples because they really work on, I always say you don't want to be a one-sided athlete. These are just kind of some sports where you're really getting your whole body involved, both sides. So it helps with just balance and keeping kind of a, a good symmetry so that not, you're not losing, you're not off center, okay? Um, and it doesn't have to be swimming if you don't like to swim or you don't know how to swim. There's the YMCA, there's different uh, facilities. If you want to do aquatic therapy and you feel like it would benefit you because you're off balance, talk to your doctor and say, you know what, I really want to do some aquatic therapy, like have it more formal. And talk to your doctor about maybe a, get, getting a prescription for that. If you find that you have, you know, b balance issues or trouble with your gait for whatever reason, they can probably do that. Um, so two good exercises to consider, swimming and Tai Chi. All right, um, a little bit more about just pain. I kind of came back to it. Recognizing nerve pain. This is a doctor, when I hear a patient come in and say, I have these, this pain, and I say, describe your pain to me. 
These are things, these are some words here that when I hear those words, I think, oh, this person's maybe having some nerve type pain. Okay, there may be other components to their pain, but it kind of shoots out to me as, yeah, there may be some nerve involvement here. So pins and needles, people say I got the pins and needles, I'm numb. At first, when I first started out in medicine, I was like, how can numb be painful? I'm not feeling anything. What do you mean they're numb? What do you mean that's painful? But numbness can be discomforting to people. It's just not a comfortable feeling. So numb, people will come in and say, my numbness makes me really uncomfortable. Uh, the tingling sensation, burning sensations. I got burning, my arm's burning. You can, they can describe it as being cold as well. So maybe not even just heat, but as cold. Uh, sharp, shooting, stabbing. Uh, they might have increased sensitivity to touch or temperature. Things that wouldn't have normally caused them pain before now feel painful. Okay, so these are just recognizing that, yeah, I'm having a little nerve pain. Um, so managing nerve pain, again, these are kind of the examples I was giving that you guys have had talks on before, so I'm not going to get into details of them all. I just want you to know that there's options out there that you should maybe consider, talk to a doctor about. Medications, prescription medications. You may have tried some of these, you may have not. There are certain medications out there that are actually, that's their purpose. They help stabilize the membrane of nerves, the cell membrane. So we call them membrane stabilizers or neuropathic agents. Gabapentin, Gabapentin, Lyrica, Cymbalta. You've heard some of those probably on commercials and the like. Um, then there's non-prescription stuff. You can get over-the-counter creams and the like that or you, you can try. I just Googled neuropathy yesterday or the day before, and like a bunch of stuff pops up. So be aware that I, I, the next one kept saying, I wanted you to just, I wrote that specifically because I want you to just be careful with it. If you come across it, you can use it and it may help. It does, it does have benefit, but just be careful because it's not something that you want to just, for the first time, like rub all over your legs, okay? It's made from the chili pepper powder, chili pepper, and if you do decide you want to use it, it's over the counter. You want to apply it to like a small dime quarter size to see how you react to it before you decide you're going to rub it all over your body. So a small little piece of, of an area and see if it does any benefit. Um, you might have to actually use it for a little while to see some benefit, get, kind of get used to that burning sensation. But the other thing is you want to wear gloves with that medicine because it's going to, it's chili pepper. So you want to have gloves on because you don't want to then, after using it, touch your eyes or your nose or your mouth, any kind of mucous membrane, because that'll be a bad situation. So just be careful with it. I just wanted to mention it because I think some people do get benefit from it. I think it can be beneficial if you use it correctly, okay? Um, and then alternative options, acupuncture, <clears throat> massage, a TENS unit. So massage, I, I love massage. I don't have neuropathy yet, might one day, but I don't. But it's still good, right? Massa everybody likes massage, it feels good. It increases blood flow to areas, right? It, that touch, that tactile sensation helps our body kind of get used to being just, we call it desensitization a lot of times. If people are having really bad nerve pain, neuropathy, a lot of times they don't want to touch their leg or whatever, whatever it might be. If you, we, you know, get used to touching, it actually helps over time to kind of calm that pain. So massage can be good. It's good for our, it, it's good for just pain in general because I think it helps with relaxation as well, okay? And then a TENS unit, I'm not sure if any of you are familiar with it. That's something usually you get from a therapist, physical therapy might prescribe it. Uh, something to consider, it does help local pain. If you're having local pain, what it does is it kind of, fools our body into thinking that the pain that we're normally feeling isn't, isn't there by using a different sensation. Um, if you have a machine that you've had in the past, it's good to get that kind of monitored with, your, with a therapist, like a physical therapist, to just see if the settings in the machine are correct. Because my understanding is there's different settings and the, you adjust those settings. So if it's been, if you have a machine sitting that's been like five years old or three years old, you know, you want to see somebody to make sure you're using it correctly. And then relaxation techniques, meditation, breathing, visualization, all those things can help with pain. Um, breathing, I like, I personally, I like breathing out of all those, but um, just laying in bed and just really taking that time to 
uh, let's focus on our breaths, right? We take some deep breath in and we breathe out. About, on average, we should breathe in about half the time it takes us to breathe out. So I, I count. There's different, you can Google, there's different breathing techniques, but I'll do like a one, two, three, four, five, and then slowly six, seven, eight, nine, ten. You know what I mean? So it's just you breathe in, you breathe out. And just if you're feeling a little bit pain, a little bit of pain, a little bit more anxiety, um, whatever it might be, just focus on your breaths. Uh, visualization, meditation, I'm not getting into that, but there's definitely uh, benefit. I think that's it. Is that it? Nope, never mind. This is the last thing. Um, talk to your doctor. I am a physician, but I'm not, I wasn't trying to give anybody any specific medical advice. You really want to talk to your doctor about some issues that you might be concerned with. Remember that we are at fall risk. And that's what we talked about doing things to, that keep us active, but the, that are going to keep us safe as well. So talk to your doctor. Know about your bone health. Know if you have you know, osteopenia, osteoporosis. What are you doing about that? So that if you do have a fall, think prevention. You know what? I am a fall risk. What happens when I do fall? How can I prevent being injured when I do fall? So know what your bones look like. If you should be taking calcium supplementations or vitamin D supplementations, how much? If you haven't had a vitamin D level checked in the last year or so, what, you know, ask. Talk to your doctor and say, should I be taking calcium supplementations? Do I need to check my vitamin D? I'm concerned, you know, if I do have a fall that my bones are healthy. And then review medications regularly. Um, and just go through that list with your doctor and say, do I, do I need to be on this medication? Why am I taking this medicine? You should know why you're on a medicine, what its purpose is. And really just minimize the number of medications. Because as we get older, our body metabolizes medications differently. Right? You may have been on a medication for 10 years. Do I still need this medication? Is it something that is a medication that maybe I started when I was a little bit younger? Does it affect elderly or older people a little bit different than it affected me 15 years ago? Um, and then be aware of just... A lot of medications do, if you're having any orthostatic symptoms where you get dizzy when you stand um, or you're feeling like really sleepy throughout the day, look at that medication list and say, could any of these medications possibly be contributing to these symptoms? And that doesn't mean you don't need that medicine, but you just want to make sure you're taking that medicine at the right time of day. A lot of times if a medication is going to cause somebody to be sleepy or if it's going to cause their blood pressure to drop and make them orthostatic, that would be a medication you want to be taking at nighttime right before you go to bed to use to your advantage. You wouldn't want to take a medicine like that early in the morning. So just know, you know, talk to your doctor about those medicines. Is there a best time I should take this? Uh, and then drug interactions. Be careful with a lot of things you might be taking over the counter. It's just like herbal supplementations and the like, because they too can have interactions with medications that you might be on. Um, and then again, medications. Some medications actually affect our bones can be more prone to having us get osteoporosis or the like. So again, when you're looking at that list of medicines with your doctor, say, or just think things to ask, I should say, you know, could any of these medications be affecting my bones? Could they, if, you know, I'm feeling a little dizzy throughout the day, could this be causing any dizziness? Or, you know, just so that you're on a good, a good regimen with the least side effects and as few medications as you, you know, can take help in a good way. Um, if you have any cardiac issues, you, any kind of cardiac issues, and you're starting like an exercise routine, talk to your doctor. Is, do I need to start, or do I need to have like a stress test, an exercise stress test performed before I start like a regular exercise routine? So it's just good to get their input and see what they feel. Um, what else? And then manage your comorbidities. So what does that mean? You guys know what comorbidities are? No, no. no, no. That's that list of all the other things you have on top of the neuropathy. Like, you're like, what other problems do you have? Co what, so we, we use the word comorbidities, but it's the coronary artery, artery disease, the blood pressure, the high cholesterol. What else do we have? Any, you know, any, other, any other thing, diabetes, those are comorbidities. So you want to keep your comorbidities under control. 
And I realized as I was laying in bed, I don't know, last night or this morning, comorbidities has the word morbid in it, morbidity, right? <laughs> so, remember, so our goal, remember, is to have a good quality of life and to avoid morbidity, right? And so by keeping your blood pressure controlled, it will help manage, not blood, well, blood pressure. I was thinking, I meant to say blood sugars. Blood sugars controlled, if, if, that, if that's the underlying cause. And I'm, of, uh, we all, so diabetes can have effect, you know, can cause peripheral neuropathy. You might have another cause. But just managing, your actu managing the disease process can help, right, with, make, with things not getting worse, okay? And then keep your eyes healthy. That's my last thing. Um, because remember, we're fall risk. We need to be able to see where we're going. It's so easy for us to just avoid that eye exam, right? And so, or driving at night, whatever it might be. So it's important to keep your eyes healthy, see an, ophthalmol an ophthalmologist or an optometrist regularly. All right, questions? Just a comment on the Tai Chi part. So yeah, yeah. The first thing you really need to learn Tai Chi is to meditate. Okay, very good. That's number one. Number very two good. is how to correctly breathe. Exactly. And what does that lead to? It's the relaxation of the body. So mm -hmm. there, there are particular stances that you take beginning. Right. Where you just stack your bones on top of each other. And you can literally feel it after a while. I don't nice. know if that's happened for the folks that are taking it from dorm. Or you guys, uh, under dorm's guidance, or someone else's for your Tai Chi. Norm Gill? No, I go on Wednesdays. Okay. So it's yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yes, yes. Of oh, nice. Yeah, well. Very good. Okay, so good point. But can you can you start the Tai Chi and build on that breathing, or do they teach you that kind of as you get into it? You really learn that from the very beginning. Learn it from the very beginning. Yeah, right. That's okay. one of the that's one of the basic kind fundamentals. Of yeah, right. Very good. The other thing about falling, I don't have any people here to really think about if you're, am I going to fall or not? Well, you don't know. Right. But are you? But how are you going to be prepared unless you think about it? Exactly. And a lot, there's a lot of not argument or, um, you know, it's unclear. A lot of people will come in with a fall. That's what I talk about, our bone health. Uh, maybe they, they come in and they've had a fall and they have a hip fracture. A lot of times it's unclear whether or not they fell and that caused the hip fracture or if their bone was so weak that they had a fragility fracture and then after that hip broke, then they fell, right? So that's why it's so important just to keep, well, to think about safety and to think about falls. Am I in an environment right now where I, where I really feel unbalanced and can really can have a fall? Uh, how do I protect myself? I didn't get into everything, but they do actually sell like protector, hip protector pads and stuff. And that's you know, maybe when we get a little older, we're not moving around as much, or you're, you know, just things to consider that are out there. You know, how am I going to protect myself if I were to fall? Okay. Questions, comments, concerns? My father fell and broke his hip mm -hmm. and wrist. And he said that the fall did. And I believe that the hip gave away. And he fell and broke his wrist. And then, and then had the wrist. Because one. I saw it. And he, he didn't trip over anything. He just collapsed. Oh, you witnessed the fall? Yeah. Okay, yeah. Yeah. That's so it's a doctor the, told my mother. Would it, you broke your hip, and then you fell. Right, yeah. right. Because a lot of people come in and they're like, I, I fell, and I broke, you know, they never broke my hip. But a lot of times, the belief is, you know, it's hard because you did fall, so it's really hard to really say what happened. But, you know, a lot of times we think that we've had, you have a f fracture, that then subsequently you fall. Yes, ma'am. I had, had my left knee and my left hip replaced. Mm -hmm. Uh, on my right side, I'm suffering from a car accident from January when we were rear-ended. But um, my doctor wants me to start the once a week. Uh, Forteo? No, oh, that's daily. Um, Go ahead. Is it Fos Fosmex or whatever? Mm -hmm. Right, right, right. And I started reading the precautions, and it can cause a fracture. And so I'm saying, why do I want to take this? So I'm not sure the exact medication that you're referring to, but you're like, I'm going to fall out. 
So, you know, it's something that, so a lot of times there, there are risks involved with certain medications. There are. Um, if you're concerned that's about that specific medication, sometimes after a certain time period, we are at risk more for certain types of fractures, okay? But it's usually after we've been on, the, on medications after like a prolonged period of time. So they'll say like, take a medication vacation, right? So we take a break from certain medications sometimes. Um, and then there are other medications. It's the generic of Plasmax. Okay. Uh, and then there's some other medications that actually work to build bone, to build bone health. The important thing to know about osteoporosis, you can have a, you know, you can have a bone density scan that shows you have osteo, like low bone density, and oste osteopenia is what we call it. But once you've had one fracture, that's related to your bones, it's automatically called, it's automatically osteoporosis. If you've had like a vertebral fracture or a hip fracture, and it's due to, you know, bone health, then you're, it's automatically takes you out of that osteopenia category and puts you in the osteoporosis category. And so that, there are times, you know, to talk to your doctor about what can I do, what medications are best. There was another hand that was up around, yes. You know, I don't, I don't know if there's a specific association. I mean, I think you can have neuropathy and have a neuroma on top of it. Yeah, but I don't know if it would, I don't know if there's a direct relationship. I can't answer that. Did you have to, yes, do you know? There's a gentleman in the Austin group who has both. He has neuropathy and a neuroma. And it, uh, it was very complicated because they were treating his neuropathy and it wasn't going away. And that's when they said, well, you have a neuroma too, so they're treating both. I'm coming to think that the neuroma can be the original source, and that's just my own speculation. Oh, you're talking about the, a source of it. I've never heard of it causing neuropathy no. itself, you no. A neuroma and you may have neuroma. What's, What's a neuroma? neuroma? Yeah. It's a kind of inflammation of the sheath around a nerve. So a lot of times you'll get it like at the, between the toes of the, well, lower than the toe, but there's a specific area in the bottom of the foot. And so it causes just a lot of discomfort with walking on that specific area. So I, didn't hear that. You just I was just describing where the neuroma typically is. It can happen on any nerve, but most times it happens at the bottom the, of our foot where we feel the pain, where we actually feel the pain more so on top of the foot too. Um, but you can actually, it just, the sheath gets inflamed. Yeah. Is that called Morton's neuroma? Exactly, yeah. Right. I just wanted to add something. We used to let our dogs sleep inside the house, in the living room. Until one night when my husband went out and it was dark and he tripped on one of the dogs and almost fell and broke his hip. And so now the dogs sleep in the garage. <laughs> you know, though, we, <laughs> we used to joke around about doing a study to see how many times a pet was involved in somebody's fall. Because it happens so much. Yeah. So, I mean, that's a very good point. We mentioned everything else in the environment and add that. Be mindful of, where you, of your pets, especially if it's dark, where they're at. If you're walking them, make sure they're not walking you, right? Yes? I had a quick comment about medications and pain. Mm -hmm. My brother takes a lot of pain medication, and we've discovered, because I help him manage his medication, he's handicapped. But if he doesn't move during the day very much, he needs more medication. Right, right. The movement and his, of course, the more pain he has, the more tense he gets. So the relaxation and all of that combined with the movement is so important to managing his pain medications or any medication. Because with movement, he also, you get that medication moving through your body, uh, of course, the hydration and all that. Right. So we've discovered just by doing that he Less. When he's more active. Yes, exactly. Right. And he'll say, well, it hurts to move or whatever. And that's when we encourage him to make slower movements and warm up his body first, but he does need to get out of bed, get going, and 
right. know, by virtue of going to the bathroom and taking his shower and that sort of movement, and then get out, he feels better and uses. I agree. I, th I mean, I agree. I think that's what most would agree that if you're more, the more active you are, the less pain you're going to, you know, going to be in. Now there are certain conditions where activity does cause worsening pain, but just in general, a general rule of thumb is the more active we stay, the, the less pain we'll be in, kind of chronically. Yes. How widespread can neuropathy go in your body? Uh, it depends on the neuropathy. It could be, you know, if it's a typical when when we use the term like diet, you know, when when most people think of Neuropathy, a lot of times they think diabetes. That's not the over, that's not the norm. But depending, it typically affects the more distal muscles first, so further along, and so you see it kind of working its way up, right? So some people have neuropathy, if it's peripherally, both in their lower legs and in their hands and arms. So, so you can see it. Some people, you'll, depending again on the cause, some people, you can see really any part of your body can be affected. It depends specifically on the type of neuropathy that it is, the, what the cause is, and then from there you can get a little bit more localized. Some neuropathy is more patchy, where you don't have like a pretty distribution where I can say, you know what, I, I have my neuropathy from the bottom of my foot to right here, this is my neuropathy. Some neuropathy is, you know, focal. You'll see it in patchy places, not, not in one specific distribution. Is carpal tunnel and neuropathy got any relationship? Carpal tunnel, carpal tunnel is a mononeuropathy. Yes, they would be in the. It would be considered a neuropathy because it's affecting a specific nerve in a. You know, com usually it's called a compressive because it's too tight in that carpal tunnel. So yes, but you can have peripheral neuropathy on top of a carpal tunnel. Right? You can have two different things going on. You may be more prone, you know, to certain neuropathies because of an underlying neuropathy. So they're not, I wouldn't say your diabetic, neuro, or specific type of neuropathy is causing a carpal tunnel syndrome. It's usually something else. But there are certain illnesses that put you more at risk for getting a carpal tunnel. Well, I was wondering, I've had carpal tunnel operation on both hands. Mm -hmm. The left hand, it's done good. Beautiful. The right hand, it's still a lot of numbness. And mm -hmm. All the doctor said it may get better in a couple of years. It may never get better. Or it could be another process. It could be just a, a general peripheral neuropathy that's causing those symptoms. You know. Mm -hmm. Well, my whole hand gets numb sometimes. Yeah. But I'm I, sorry. I work it. The more I work it, the better it feels. Very good. Thank that's you. Good.